Greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us today uh, for introducing CA Ops MS Event Management and Automation Release 12.2. Um, today we're going to be seeing a presentation from Timothy Brunner, and I'm going to uh, hand over control to him so we can start his presentation. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah, hello, everyone. Uh, again, my name is uh, Tim Brunner. Uh, welcome to this session where we, we are introducing the features and the enhancements from Ops MBS 12.2. This, this session is scheduled to go one hour. However, based on the questions, we may go long. We don't want to shut questions down. Uh, we will record it. If you can't make the end of the session, the recording will soon be available to everyone. Just a note here, and you probably heard this when you connected in, is you have to, you're, you're muted by default, and you have to hit asterisk six to unmute, and then pond six to remute. So we would encourage you to do that. That'll help cut down the background noise if you're, if you're muting when you're not online. Let me advance here. There we go. Uh, I want to introduce the session panelists. I am joined from a number of folks from the Ops MBS product team here today. Um, several engineers, including Mark Eddy and Joe Lewis, they are on, on in the room with me or online. Uh, the director of software engineering, Tom Jenkins. Uh, two of our support engineers, Rob Helshin and Justin Francis, uh, the product manager, Michael Keel, and uh, again, myself, uh, Tim Bruner, the product owner. So uh, we have a good field here to take questions, so if you have questions, we welcome them. Okay, so while this is a GA release, I mean, there's no warranties guaranteed that I get everything correct in the rest of this presentation, although I've gone through it a few times, showed it to others, it looks good, but again, no warranty. Always have to have this slide. Okay, so Ops MBS 12.2. Um, the general availability of this came in two phases something we called an incremental release in June 2014 and a complete GA release in November 2014. So, a little background on the incremental. This is a new process we started with our agile development processes. Uh, I had the initiative to get it going about a year ago finally got it rolled out in ops midway through the project in June 2014. The goal here is, is to give you a level set uh, for the release that we're working on, in this case 12.2, where you apply that release on systems that you want to be able to experiment with it. And then the features and the enhancements as we develop them are, are released via Agile PTFs, basically the same as a problem PTF, just a, a new feature enhancement PTF. The, G, the GA release in November was just a repackaging of that. However, if you do still have the incremental on and some PTFs, you can still advance up to the, to the complete GA release by just applying PTFs. If you have questions on that, I mean, don't hesitate to contact support. So the goals of this release were, uh, at a very high level, were to extend SysFlex awareness, high availability, reliability of different areas of the product, to improve usability, a term we use internally here is called land lighter. Uh, the main goal was to make things simpler, where we um, where we can possibly do that, where we get your feedback, they need to be simpler. With Ops MBS, there's always been strong interest in, in interfacing uh, to the distributed environment. Sometimes this is through products like Automation Point. Uh, in many cases, it's through some of the other technologies we have at CA, uh, NIMSoft, uh, SOI, Spectrum service desk, uh, we've added some enhancements in the product that begin to make this easier to do. We extended the web capabilities we introduced in the 12.1 release with Web Center with a mobile version. We'll show you that. And, and basically, you know, a lot of the requests that come in through DARS, through ideation, are to simplify the toolkit, basically make it easier to use. I will say there were probably two primary areas here. One was really adding to the security capability, the security and auditing. And the second one was really in verification. Uh, in many cases, you could do something. And uh, if you hit enter, basically it happened. We didn't give you an option to possibly cancel out. There were some uh, requests for that type of thing. But we will cover all those uh, as we go through this. So let's hit the first theory. The, um, the extended SysPlex awareness, high availability. The two main features that kind of fit under this are the consolidated ops log and some SSM, GA, SysPlex improvements. So 
So the consolidated OPSOG and also what we call the merged OPSOG uh, was based on customer need to debug prompts that span multiple systems. Okay, the way this works here is, is I highlighted the sections you really need to fill in here when you're consolidating OPSOG, pretty much the time period, like either in you know, days, the day and the hour and the minutes, or the last number of minutes from the current period backwards. The systems you want to consolidate from, uh, you can select the whole sysplex, you can select the sysplex, then unselect systems, you can just select some individual systems. Up at the top right, you see that you can actually filter as part of the merging process. You don't have to merge everything. If you're only interested in select selective jobs, you can create a filter and then just um, merge by that filter. This technology is built on what we call merged data sets. The merged data sets, there's one per system, and they have to be on shareable DASI. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we advance to the next slide. So in this example here, what you're seeing is we have a consolidated OPSOG from three systems, you see the CA11, the CA31, the XE61. It's sorted in chronological order. The chronological order is going to be based on GMT if you have different time zones here. And again, this is implemented by the merging of, of the OPSOGs in these individual merged data sets. How do we do that? Well, well, what we did is we extended some of the, the OPSREX capabilities we had to use ourselves in this implementation. Uh, one was the OPSLOG function, it introduced about five years ago. This function allows you to extract from OPSLOG. We added a new capability where you could extract from OPSLOG and save the raw records. That's what we call this EXT OPMO. And basically, you can save that in a file. And in the example down here, you're seeing that we're extracting the last 120 seconds of OPSLOG and saving it in a file pointed to by the MyDD. So, so why did we actually expose this to customers? Well, as part of the Agile process, we showed the customers what we were doing, and the feedback we got is they would like to have this for their own use. So we, we had some discussions internally and decided to make this available for customer use. So you now have the capability to extract this. The, the one issue is going to be is this is our raw data for the record. You're going to see some things that are unprintable there. But if you want to later read it back in into a in storage OPSLOG, it could be useful for that. Okay, so as part of that, we had to add another function. And again, we decided to expose this to customers also. It's called the OPSLOG MG function. This is how you read things back into an in storage read only OPSLOG. From, um, from a data set. And in this case, the input data set is on the DD name here. Again, you're going to a specific OPS subsystem. And the, um, the log that you're reading into has to already have been defined in, in your OPS log uh, collection of up to 32 OPS logs. So you specify that log here and we read things back in. For some reason, if you, if you input a log that was bigger than 4.9 million records, we would just wrap it. So you'd have the latest records available. Okay, so this is a new feature we added. It's probably one of the it's one of the major features. We're looking for input on this feature. You know, as you begin to use it, we'd like to know what works well, what doesn't, what could be simpler. Uh, is there things in terms of the configuration that uh, you're finding you have to specify some configuration over and over again, and we could just allow it to be done in one place? We want to hear more about that. So. Um, welcome to hear your feedback. Uh, you can email us directly. You can put something on the community site, um, whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, with that uh, feature cover, we'll move on to the, um, the System State Manager Global application. And we call it version 2 here. Um, this is basically a new version of that application that allows you to simplify the shifting of work between systems in the same sysplex. That's the key aspect of this version of SSMGA is all the systems, all the participating systems must be in the same sysplex. The original SSMGA does not have that limitation. It, it's also designed to support uh, cross-system dependencies in an easier manner. And um, the difference in technology is that the original SSMGA, which is still supported if you're using it, you're fine. Um, We'd like to understand over time how we could perhaps help you move to the new SSMGA, uh, but if that's not the case, that's fine. 
fine also. But the original facility used multi-system facility. And if you've used it, you'll notice it's based on VTAM, TCP IP, uh, our CCI communications, which indirectly can use some coupling facility technologies. But in some cases, the updates are at the, at the second level, perhaps several seconds. We switched it to use the new SysFlex variable technology, which this is the function, this off spare serve, is the function for that. And it, it really takes the updates that ha happen across system, it takes them down to a subsystem, le sub second level, where you don't even really see any delays. So um, early uh, reports have been, customers have been very happy with it. Obviously, we're looking for more, uh, more feedback. It's a little easier to manage and set up and that you have no global system anymore and there's no need to replicate the data of movable resources. So it's accessed from the 411 G2 panel. There's a new panel there, the G2 instead of the 2G, and the documentation is available here. So again, something that we would welcome uh, user input on, community discussion. Uh, we want to hear how we did and where we need to extend it. Okay, so let's move on to the LAN lighter, improve usability, simplify. Okay, some of this was um, perhaps what I would call technical debt. And if you haven't ha heard that term, that's sort of, uh, it's something that perhaps in the, in the past we would call an enhancement or a new feature, but really it was sort of a deficiency that, or something that lagged behind. So some of this was just catching up. And, and the particular area with that was the AOF test facility. Uh, we introduced the MLWTO capability for uh, message roles. This is multi-line WTOs uh, in 12.0. Uh, we just caught up now with the uh, AOF test facility and supporting that. So you can now test that with the AOF test facility. So one thing I want to kind of show you here, because in two slides I'm going to talk about it, is this live commands option. This is basically saying do you want this to be processed, really not in test, but in live mode, which means the actions will take place. So uh, that was causing some customer issues in, in that customers did not realize if they changed that to yes, it was staying yes. So in, in a couple slides, I'll talk about that. <coughs> the other area that we um, beefed up the AOF test with, it, with our own API events, if you're not familiar with API events a while back, we added capabilities for other CA products to communicate events to Ops MBF, the underlying facility is called an API test macro. Um, they can communicate their events to Ops outside of normal WTOs. And uh, it supports very long records. They're not limited to the 128 bytes. The API records also have a variety of variables. Some of those variables are listed down here. Application ID, color, user text, version levels. Um, and then for each specific type of use, they can define their own variables. So the ones we were lagging behind, some of the most significant ones, were the um, Insight DB2 product, which just with their R18 release, that when GA this past fall, they added two different API event types. We now support, we immediately supported that with the AOF test facility. Over the past few years, CICS has added API events for a number of areas, MBS, CICS, IMS, TCP, MQ. Uh, those, those are now all supported with the um, AWEP test facility. We added support for the API events coming out of our workload automation products, ESP and CA7. There's also support for general events, and um, these are the ones we haven't yet supported. Now, obviously, with those, we're not going to deal with the specific event variables. We're going to deal with the general the common event variables. Uh, some of those, just if you're not real familiar with those, are things, things in our own product, which uh, when we added new events for things like the switch operations facility, the Linux connector, the hardware services, we use the API events for those. In the future, we'll probably beef up AWEP tests with those items. Uh, right now, you have to use the general version. So that supports an AWEP test. Back to the live command I talked about earlier is the um, basically if you switch out of the AOF test panel, okay, we make sure that the default value is no to prevent an accidental issuing of command. People are doing that. Uh, if you change it to yes, the value remains unchanged until you go back to the list, the role list. Once you get back to the role list, it changes back to no. We don't want you to select a new role, come back in, and then automatically have the action take place. 
I want to be very cautious there. Okay, another area of simplification with the Office of Archival Process. You can kind of just see from the uh, flow chart here, old versus new. Looks a little simpler on the new side. The old side was based on a combination of message roles, batch programs, recs, parameters, and it had all those sort of convoluted things. Um, the new process is based on parameters and basically a new subtask that runs as part of the Office MBS main region. So much simpler. Uh, if you look here, we kind of show you the old way, whether you needed a message role, a TOD role, uh, parameters in some cases, and, and the new way, which is pretty much parameter driven. So all the parameters are in one place. It's automatic GDG based and model allocation. The new subtask. And the other big enhancement here is taking the trigger process and making that all parameter driven rather than message driven. So you can select the number of messages, you can select an interval, or you can select a certain time period to do the archiving. And then space settings, obviously you've got to set some space for your files uh, by the browse max in use parameter. We encourage you to take a look at that, uh, particularly if you're starting to use archival. You know, obviously we're going to keep the old ways working. We understand a lot of people have invested in that. Uh, there's no intention of retiring the old way. If you're using that, you're fine. Okay, another area of simplification. And this kind of comes back to SSM. I talked about the, uh, the global application earlier. Uh, SSM was originally something that goes back to the automate days, which is a separate product, and we moved it into Office MBS. Uh, in some sense, we moved it as to how it was there. Uh, what wasn't tied together real well was the actions capability. So now off the, uh, the main panel system where you're defining a resource, you can click, you can point and shoot on edit actions. And there's actually ways through um, ISPF to highlight the point and shoot field so you can actually see that highlighted. In the example, I just boxed it here, but you can actually have that pop up to highlight. And it will take you to this panel where you can edit uh, your action. And what you're seeing here is all the different uh, state mismatches and the associated action. So right off the main resource panel, you can now see that. It's an area we think is pretty important to try to make things more resource-centric in the SSM definition. This is kind of a first step there. You'll probably see more coming in uh, the following releases. Uh, sort of a something that fits in simplification. There's also a verification here is um, Customers, what we find over the past few years is, is customers, in some sense, the people that set up SSM are different from the people that operate it. And they were a little concerned that the people operating it were, were taking actions that they did not quite understand what they were taking. And, and one particular area was with multi-system commands, dealing with uh, starting or stopping resources that have prereqs and subrecs. So the M1 is the most important here. It hits on those commands and gives you a confirmation, and I'll show you an example in a minute related to um, multi-resource commands. Some customers did like the idea of having it even at the uh, single resource level, so we added it for uh, start, D is stop, C is cancel, U is uh, unknown. So, so you can go that option. Uh, the default still remains the way it was in the past with the no option but uh, you're free to change that, and it's again by the user. This isn't meant to be a security mechanism, it's more meant to be a, uh, a verification mechanism. Here's the example where you're stopping, a re stopping using the W line command to stop resources and all dependent resources. They all have, happen to be up now. In the past, you would know you were stopping this mixed SM1 resource, but you will not know you're stopping these two just make SSM2 and SSM3 resources. You will not know that. They would just stop. In this case now, you can get a list and see what you're stopping. Before I go on to the next section, any, any sort of questions on in this area before we, we move on to uh, talking about some of our new um, cross-platform, cross-enterprise capabilities? And again, if you want to unmute, you need to hit asterisk six. Yeah, a lot of people here from PNC Bank. I do have a question. Yeah. Okay, good luck. Um, on uh, 411.2, 
Um, and that is something that I actually, I believe I brought up uh, in the past. When you get into 411.2, one of the uh, line commands is the D to delete a defined resource. I'm not sure if that is still available, but uh, I think that we would all agree that that is a pretty destructive command that does not have the reversal and uh, it's exposed to the operation staff that uh, really do not uh, uh, might have a good understanding what they are doing. A D can be also confused with a display command and uh, I'm not sure if that really belongs there. Uh, so lots of good. We're kind of shaking, nodding our heads, yes, here. That yeah, we agree with you. Yeah, I don't know if the verification has been added for that or not, Laszlo. But yeah, that's a good point. Uh, we can take a look at that and uh, make that a little safer for people using that 4112 panel. Okay. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, you know, if we have a delete command, then I would also assume that we probably should have an insert or add command. Uh, because uh, don't you hate when you uh, press a button on your, on your remote for your TV and something happens, but to undo what you did, you have to get up and walk up to the TV because there is no button on the remote to reverse that uh, that action. So if we have a delete, we should also have an insert for uh, some kind of consistency. That's a good point. Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. I, I noted this. Hey, Lazo, let me reach out to you afterwards just to kind of refine the wording of this. And we'll put some sure. in the community. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions at this point? Okay. So again, we're open for questions as we continue, but uh, we'll move on here. Okay. So in um, in 12.2, we introduced. Um, what I'm calling inbound RESTful web services, that's sort of a, inbound is sort of my term. Uh, these are web services that reach into Ops MBS. Um, I kind of distinguish that from in the future, we'd like to be able to reach outbound from Ops, but uh, that's something beyond 12.2. So the, the three areas we had these for were querying RDF table data, running Ops Rex automation, and being able to generate an event. Where from outside Ops, and this could be anywhere in the distributed world. It could be another mainframe system, be a Z Linux system, wherever you want to run these things. And I'll go into details on each one of these there. So let's just do a basic overview of what RESTful, what does that really mean here? And the first two things, just to what we want to give you the capability to do, one is reach into the mainframe and kick off some automation policy, and two is to, is to basically reach into Ops MBS data and allow you to more easily get that for your web displayable reports. When we were uh, uh, discussing this release with a number of customers, what we find in advance of this is customers were using a lot of their own mechanisms to push the, uh, the data across to the other side. They were saving it in RDF tables, uh, perhaps using uh, C saving it off in a CSV format and FTP in it across. Uh, some were using HTTP requests from from TSOE rec to push it across. Uh, we wanted to create a standard, secure way to, to access that data. So that's the reason for the RDF. A RESTful principle is that it's stateless. And what that means is from one call to the next, there's no memory. So we can't, we don't introduce a call where we remember what type of data we asked on the last call. Let's say we asked for the columns of a table. We, we don't remember that between calls. Each call stands on its own. That's just part of the RESTful principle. Uh, the methods we use are the get to retrieve data, the post to request something, and when we do that, we send an XML document across as to what we're requesting. It uses URIs that mimic the structure of the resources being requested and returns the response in an XML document. We have had some requests to return it in JSON, JSON documents, a possible future item. Like to hear a little bit more customer input before we undertake that. Uh, it's uh, authenticated, 64-bit encrypted over HTTP, and through HTTPS we use the TLS uh, setup on Tomcat. Okay, we've uh, you probably heard a lot about the Poodle virus over the past couple months. I mean, we are if you have all the latest maintenance on, you are secure against that. We're going to force you to use TLS though, rather than SSL version three.
So here's an example of the, um, the RESTful web service to retrieve an RDF table. We're using our own QA test tool to show you the data here. In this particular case, we are retrieving um, table data for this table uh, demo X31. So you're seeing the, the columns come back in this line, and you're seeing the particular data elements of the columns come back here. So, very simple case. Uh, you can see the XML by clicking Show XML here. We could do that. So you have access to see that in your own. I, here I thought for the presentation, more important to show the data. And just to show you that it's secure, we're going to ask for logon credentials, a username and a password connecting into uh, the web services. 31. I mentioned earlier that we use a Tomcat. That Tomcat is, uh, that you can use is, is distributed with our CA common services. There's a particular FM ID for that. Uh, that information is in the manual. If you're um, stuck on that, don't hesitate to put something on the community site or, or uh, open a support issue. Any way we can get that testing application? Yeah, you know what? Yeah, I have Mark Getty here. He's one of the panelists. It is something we build. And, and Mark, we did talk about possibly doing that, right? But we didn't. We have to look at what the, the um, the legal rights of, of distributing that. Yeah, uh, can you hear me, Tim? Yes, yes. Yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, we, I think we're, the main reason we decided not to distribute it was that it's, it only works under Internet Explorer. It's, it's just, you know, it, it uses uh, HTTP code that's unique to Internet Explorer, and generally our samples are a little more general than that. You know, we, so, I mean, you know, we could enhance it or possibly distribute it like that and just, you know, document that that's, that's the restriction. So, Mark, just that you're breaking up a little bit, but you said it only works under Internet Explorer. Is that correct? So, yes. So the question would be back to the customers. If we gave you this, maybe not even, maybe just as something on our um, support online website, would it, be, would it be useful to have this? It was just in that form. Well, if you think so, I mean, don't hesitate to let us know because we could try to give you what we have. As long as, as long as Mark, as long as we verified any third-party software we rely on that we got the right legal. Agreement. Yeah, that would be the other thing. We'd have to make sure that there's nothing in there we're not supposed to redistribute. Okay. Okay. So I have a note of that to kind of take a look at that. Thanks. Thanks. For, thanks for the question. So, so the next web service is to run an Ops Rex application. And in theory, we could have just probably did this one and not did the other two, but uh, there seem to be some more specific use cases for those. And, and there may be other things in the future that you want a specific um, web service for, maybe to enable a, a role or something or retrieve some AOF information. Uh, we're open to those type of requests. We, we don't have to just have a general one, but um, for now, this is the general one here. This is kind of interesting, and I'll show you the architecture shortly. So you can post. Uh, through the post command, you can initiate an Ops Rex program. And what that's going to cause is that, that Rex program has to live, obviously, on ZOS. Uh, the XML document will contain information on it. That, um, that Rex program is gonna, going to run in one of the OSF servers. And, and at this point, we're just saying run it, kind of like an address OSF. You're not really waiting for the output. This is just saying go run it. The interesting part of this is the next command, which is an asynchronous call, to go back and retrieve the output data. And again, it's, it's memoryless except for this response ID that um, you have to send this response ID back in. We're not saving that. You have to send it back in. Uh, we have the URI listed there with the response ID. And, and the architecture of how this works here is you basically post to a something that comes into our Tomcat server, and we tell OpsMBS to queue up a Rex program to run in an OSF server. In that Rex program you create, and we have a, a, a sample that you can kind of take a look at, we, um, we give you a capability to say what data would you like to be able to asynchronously go back and get. And that's what this is doing here. And what you see here vertically is the name of a Rex function that allows you to send lines of data um, we're saving those in temporary uh, GLB variables. There's a garbage collection process to clean that up. And then later on, you can asynchronously come back and get that information. And just 
a little bit more about that. Is so, so the REX program is this op, OPWS out. That allows you to save output for later retrieval via the GET request. And this is the, the example. This is giving you a list of AOF, AOF list of role set names and returning results. So uh, we really look for, forward to your feedback on this one. You know, there's probably a lot of ways we can enhance this in the future. But uh, I think it's a good start uh, to allow you to run automation outside, initiated outside ZOS. So the next one here is a little more specific in that you can generate an, an API event. So uh, until this point, generation of API events was only something we allowed other CA products to do. Um, and we talked about the other, some of the others earlier. Uh, here we allow you to do it through a web service. And it's done through a post, and the XML document contains information uh, containing the return code. Let me back up a second here. The way we implemented this is we actually added a new Rex function on in Ops Rex called Ops API, and that allows you, and I'll show you in a second here, to generate your own API events. We use a specific instance of that to generate web service events. And those events are going to come into a role type called API space WS asterisk. Uh, and there's actually even a security event that you can uh, use to monitor those. So the new Rex function, Ops API, lets you generate an event. However, we're using that for this. And uh, it'll trigger an API role, although it the code that you have after API is dependent on your event code here. We're specifically using WS for the web services ones. These are some of the common variable values. You can fill those in in the, um, in the parameters for this API uh, event type. So, so if you have a need to funnel something back into Ops MDS roles from your Rex program, this is one way to do it. In the past, often you would issue WTOs and then have something come into a message role. Uh, this perhaps could be a better way now. Okay, so those are web services. Really looking forward to your feedback. Um, looking forward to use cases as to how web services outbound from Ops MBS to various distributed solutions might be useful also. So we extended the web center capabilities uh, with a mobile version. And primarily what we're showing is uh, mismatched resources. And in this initial display you're seeing here, you can see sort of percentage of mismatched resources in SSM on a single system, the local system, or you can see it globally across all systems. This is kind of useful if systems are being brought up or brought down. They come on through this. This will resize itself to your uh, application. It, it's not an app in the sense that you install it on an iPhone or a Samsung phone or a tablet. It's an app and it's, it's an app through a URL. You still connect to the same URL. And um, right now it's a browser only type information. So here you can see uh, percentage of mismatches, and here you can see mismatch, specific mismatch resources. And again, this screen will resize itself to the size of your um, tablet or iPhone. Quick question yes. for you on those. Is that something that we would be able to uh, build out on our own? Yeah. So, so, so the specifically that mobile piece? Uh, the the screens, uh, if we wanted to build some additional information available out on web services, uh, is there a toolkit that we can use to go and create the panels and add in our own data? So that piece there that, that um, we just showed you, that's based on the Ops MBS Web Center, co Center component that was introduced in 12.1. That is actually separately implemented from our web service capability. That's that's not tied directly into that. So now your question sounds kind of intriguing because I'm thinking with the web services we gave you, could you build some user interface? Could we make that easier to build user interfaces? Sounds like a, a good discussion that we probably ought to have. Yeah. To build your own thing more of a formal way to do something yeah. yourself. Yeah, we can investigate that and get back to you. Yeah. Now, Thank if you, you want to tweak what you're seeing in the mobile app, then we can t we can work with the um, engineers to see if we can update that. 
If you let's say you want to see some different aspect of SSM, or do you have additional comments? Uh, no, that was it. We just saw some other opportunities for utilizing the mobile uh, web services, and uh, especially with with different views. Um, well, I do have a follow-up question. The the different versions of web services. Uh, we're also going to be supporting Netmaster and, and SysView as well as Ops. Uh, are all those web services? Can all those be included in one, or are those three different versions? Yeah. You know, something, so you're specifically talking web services. Um, we probably have to follow up with those teams. I'm not, we're not in this room completely aware of what they're doing. Our reliance is on Tomcat, and I suspect that their implementations could use that too, but I haven't confirmed that. Yeah, not everybody is using Tomcat. Um, we went out and grabbed the Tomcat manuals and some development tools uh, for creating the, the wrappers for the data, um, but weren't sure if that was something that would fit in well with your your base. Can I get your name, please? Keith Jones. Oh, Keith. Oh, okay, thank you, Keith. Okay, I should have known that. <laughs> okay, thanks. Okay, let us follow up, Keith. Okay, there's some good questions there. Okay, and and for the others that are interested, we'll put something on the used community site once we get some kind of updates. Then, you got some notes. Okay, thanks, Mike. Okay, thanks, Keith. Good questions. Okay, anything else on the web services before I move on? Okay. Okay, so we'll move on to the area of um, extending, simplifying the toolkit. I mentioned early on there were some security things. There's sort of things, general things around event management. You know, we always have requests for ops rex improvements, a new, couple new farms, um, new query capabilities, new actions. And then there was one item for the switch operations facility. So, so the first request here is uh, security related with the ops secure function. So we have a security log parameter which basically said, do you want uh, failed accesses? Do you want to log? record for those or not. And uh, the request we had was to allow allow you to make it more specific to each individual op secure request. Uh, depending on how you specify this log option here, you override for that particular request what the global parameter is. So you can do this at a specific op secure level. Uh, perhaps you're only interested in selective failures. In that case, set this to no and turn the log option off for those requests. And here's an example of how you do that. Okay, the other areas of security had to do with propagating user IDs with commands, both with um, address offer when coming out of command role, and you'll see a later case here when running commands in a USS uh, server. So the, the particular issue there, and kind of really technical, that again is, is if you came into a command role and some user had issued that command and you knew the user ID, and even if you had to check user ID parameter set, when the address offer was issued, we lost the context of that user ID, and it wasn't really issued in, in that request. This is allow you, this prop user keyword allows you to keep the context of who issued, who triggered the command role through the command, and then evaluate address offer under that user ID. And we implemented this for both the local and a remote system. So in this example here, you're seeing the command roles on one system, but we're passing the request over to the other we will actually pass the user ID over to that other system. And if you have check user ID set on that other system, uh, we will check, uh, you'll, you will get a check there. So, so uh, just a sort of another um, level of security that you didn't have before. Okay, similarly with the USS environment, um, Again, there's a, there's a new parameter here, similar to the one we have for OSF service, called check user ID. And uh, the default, the original behavior was no security. And what that means for all work that enters the USS, off USS start a task, the server, the security privileges are those assigned to the user ID associated with that start a task. They're really not, no, they're nobody's end user ID. If you put check user ID, 
then if the work comes from TSO users through an address USS host command, the privileges are those assigned to that TSO user ID. If they come out of roles, if you do an address USS, then again it's going to be based on the privileges associated with the start attack. So this just gives you kind of an additional level of security if you have TSO users issuing these commands. Probably not something done that often, but it's kind of nice to know that TSO users don't have open uh, access to issue any command they want. This was an enhancement to, uh, to our multi-line WTO feature uh, to allow other automation products that may be following our intercept into the system for the events, our subsystem interface, to be able to also automate off those. Uh, some of them are uh, uh, products that are, have, are in a similar area. If you set this to auto, you can now allow that capability to happen. Uh, and you can also test in your code here as to what this is um, set to. If you set this to auto, uh, you can test in your code uh, whether access is going to be allowed to later products. So you know if somebody else is going to automate that particular event. And, and if you're familiar with the uh, MPF farms, this is equivalent to setting uh, the auto farm to yes or no. They can now do that through flags. <laughs> the off thresh function, uh, for many years we've had requests to help you with throttling of roll firing. Uh, this is our first stab at giving you something there. Basically what we allow you to do from within a roll is call this function um, and then specify some interval and we will tell you the number of times we've seen that event in that interval. There's an E option that means it's for that particular event that you see it. Uh, in the future we are looking at adding additional options by ASID, the ASID issues that event and also by specific selection criteria. So uh, give you a little bit more flexibility here. In the meantime, we'd appreciate your feedback on this. After the interval elapses, the counter goes back to one. We don't actually throttle the rolls ourselves. We give you the, some counts so you can make decisions yourself as to when to take actions and when not to. Address offer. If you've used this command in the past, you probably find it very cumbersome and that the output comes back in the EDQ. There can be many words. We had provided you with a sample program in the past to create, to turn that into variable output. Uh, this enhancement now allows the data to come back in either Rex variables, or if you're calling it from a CLIST, in CLIST uh, variables, uh, much easier to use. If you had made use of the IMS type 2 command added in the, in the 11.7 and 11.8 releases, you saw that we had done that with those specific commands. Now we do it for anything. I've already had uh, some discussion with uh, customers taking advantage of this and good positive feedback. I would appreciate your thoughts also. So in 12.1, we introduced the Sysplex variable capability. I talked about earlier how with our um, uh, SSMGA version 2, we took advantage of it. Uh, one immediate piece of feedback we got is that we had not handled the uh, create update very well in the initial version. And um, the issue has to, is, is related to often you have uh, multiple pieces of automation where there's a race condition as to which piece will want run first. Perhaps the uh, automation is running in response to different events and the first piece that runs needs to create the variable. Well, if you don't know which one's going to create it, then you've got to have some uh, convoluted automation where you try to update it, and if you're not able to update it because it doesn't exist, you have some various return codes, and then you go off and create it. Um, very cumbersome indeed. So we added a capability here that uh, in 12.2, you can just update it. If you update it and it doesn't exist, we will go off and create it. Is there an option on that to do that, to not create it? Uh, no. Okay. So if, you don't, if it doesn't exist and you update it, we will create it here. So you can avoid that having to deal with that race condition. Now that said, this old method will still work. We're not going to stop that. If you've got that coded that way, okay, that, um, we'll just basically bypass all this code here in this if statement. So, um, 
made heavy investment in SysPlex variables, continuing to make an investment in it, uh, looking for your feedback as you use it. We've had much uh, feedback over the years that making, that replicating individual system uh, GLB variables across multiple systems is very cumbersome through MSF. This is a much simpler way to deal with that. So definitely would appreciate your feedback. Any way we can get to looking at them through 4.8? That sounds like a reasonable enhancement request. Okay. Thank you. Just switch operations facility, kind of uh, something that a customer that had really started diving into the use of this came back with us. What we find is that in some cases the users that are dealing with the switches and the port connectivity are, are not the same users that initialized the DASB volumes. So the user wanted the capability to very pass online without bringing the devices online. So this kind of allows them to do that, that individual operation. Let somebody else deal with bringing the devices online. And several miscellaneous improvements. Um, office info, you know, function we have that allows you to query a variety of information had a request to be able to query um, information on the scheduling environment, find a way to do that in, in the JES2 world, so added that option to allow you to query that. A while back, we introduced a time format option with OpsLog, where you could put the current time in the upper right corner of the screen, no matter where you are in terms of the messages you were profiling. Uh, the default option was an M, which allows you to see basically the, first, the time of the first message you're seeing. What we find is when you clear the profile, it cleared the C and went back to the M. So we allowed you to keep the C option. We don't affect that C option because we're figuring you'd like that to survive a profile clear. Had customers come back to us, I think there's a community posting ideation on this. Is uh, um, they when they enter re, when they re-enter Opslog, in most cases they're not reusing the same profile they were in there for the last time, so they want a way for their own self to be able to clear that profile. So there's a new option on the ops view, the general settings for your use. There's this new option that allows you to do that. We also uh, continue enhancing uh, some of our SysCheck1 uh, capabilities. The SysCheck1 I refer to is the, the data set where you're we're keeping the global variables, the legacy global variables, and the uh, RDF table data. Uh, we introduced initial features in 12.0, the 12.1 got good feedback. This one allows you to restore an existing uh, or a new SysCheck1, actually resort to an existing file from an existing SysCheck1. So you have an uh, um, existing backup data set and you can restore that. And, and some use cases for that is if you're deploying a new system, you may want to start with an existing SysCheck1 and all those global variables and, and RDF table values or a DR system where you're, you're replicating things over to a DR environment. Um, the capabilities are there now to sort of use this in that manner. We are looking in ways to make this easier that when you want to just replicate something for a new system, it will be more of a single command rather than going through a process of, of moving data sets around, but uh, initial capabilities here through this command. This is an area we have probably six or seven backlog items with improving that uh, utility. Uh, would welcome uh, your input on that. Okay, so that's uh, that pretty much covers the enhancement, the um, uh, the new features in the release in terms of technical. Uh, if you've looked at the documentation website, you will see um, uh, some new wiki type documentation. You'll see some how-to articles. Uh, looking forward to your feedback on that also. Uh, that's something you access on support online. Um, I will tell you it does allow us to, to m more easily update the doc when we get requests. There's no longer a need to wait for service packs or next releases. When we get requests, we just update it as, as uh, we need to. So we have a little time here for questions uh, or comments. Let me open it to the, uh, the customers here.
Yeah, Laszlo here again from PNC. I get a question uh, related to SSMGA. Um, I'm not sure. I have not looked. Maybe it's just my ignorance. Is there a panel uh, available uh, that would uh, uh, show me all my movable resources and from what system to which system I can move them and to show me on which system it, uh, they are active? Uh, because before SSMG was developed, uh, I did develop something on my own, um, uh, for actually from the statement 411.2 panel, you could jump into that one, and uh, the columns represented the LPARs, and the rows represented all the movable resources, and uh, let's say if I had uh, a started task called NDM, uh, and if NDM was running on system A, but I could move them to system B and C, uh, it appeared on all three systems. On the column with system A, it was green. On the other possible hosts or homes, uh, it was red. And if I just issued a, a, a select on the front of it, uh, I prompted the user uh, to choose the system where it could be moved. So I think that something like that would be maybe useful. I'm not sure uh, if uh, uh, CA uh, have had any thoughts about developing something like that. Uh, if yes, uh, I would definitely like to stay away from developing something like that again on my own. But uh, if you guys don't plan to do that, uh, I would definitely uh, invest some time and uh, uh, create something like that. Hey, Laszlo, this is Joe. Uh, in, in the newest V2 version, there there is a panel specifically to show you just the movable resources, and you can scroll scroll through the data to see you know what the primary system is and what the the, the systems they can move to. I mean, it's not as quite as elaborate as like you're talking about with the colors, red and green, but you, know, you can see the list, you can see the current system that it's on, and it's, and it's easy to update the desired system to move that resource you know, to the other system. So with uh, the, the new GAV2, that 411 G2 panel is what we have. You know, we'd be interested you take a look at it and see if there's anything we need to add. You know, we can definitely look into it. But in the old version, the, uh, the original V2, it was just that, that .g panel, and you had to use filtering to kind of weed out what you really wanted to see, because you really saw all resources across the SSMplex, and you had to really filter it down to, to get the view you were looking for. That sounds great. Thanks a lot, Joe. That's uh, pretty much what uh, we are looking for. Okay. Also, we would welcome you kind of looking into it and giving us your feedback. Absolutely. Thanks, Tim. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Well, if no other questions, I mean, would welcome I mean, your feedback in individual form also, um, either uh, through email. I mean, through the community site is fine also. Um, if you haven't used the community site much, when you put things out there, I mean, you can pretty much keep it. You can request for a private conversation if you want. It's not required to communicate it globally, but um, you're welcome to do that also. Okay, well, thanks everyone for attending. Hello. Oh, yes, did you have a Hi, Tim. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, this is Jim Nabali at SSA. I had a question about the um, SysCheck 1 restore. I wanted to know, is that a wholesale restore, the SysCheck 1, or do you have the ability to restore specific RDF tables? Yeah, this is, all, this is a wholesale, yeah. We do have some things in the backlog about even allowing you to go in and edit um, items from an existing SysCheck 1 or a GAN system. You're looking for a capability to restore a specific table. Right. right. Yeah, I think that was uh, discussed as the possibility a while back. Um, yeah. We're
Hey, hey Jim, we're going to do some checking on that. There might be some details that some of that might work. But. Okay. Okay. Thanks. We'll put it out on the community site. Okay. All righty. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and I should repeat before we end here: if you're trying to unmute, it's it's uh, pawn six to unmute. So we'll give it another uh, 30 seconds or so in case I didn't communicate that correctly. Okay, well, if no more questions, uh, Chris, uh, thanks for coordinating it. Um, again, uh, don't hesitate if you have follow-up questions. Thanks a lot, Tim. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. This thanks. recording, uh, just so everybody knows, will be online in the communities um, by mid-afternoon, just so everybody knows. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. thanks.